हेलो हाय दोरी Hi, hi everyone. So thanks for joining our live session today. We'll just wait for maybe a, a minute or two for more people to join in the session. So in the meantime, do share our video and uh, like our video so that more people can benefit from this sharing session. Thank you so much. We'll be back. Okay, so thanks for staying with us and happy Friday, everyone. Thanks for again for joining us today. I'm Doreen and I, we have with us Jean, who is a full-time investor blogging at the 1994investor.com. So tonight, he'll be talking about the recovery play and he'll be sharing with us his top picks based on the recovery theme. So, Jean, thanks for being here today and taking your time to share with us um, your analysis on the recovery sector. So, without further ado, over to you, Jean. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Right. Can you see my screen? Yes. So, okay. okay. Thank you everyone for taking your time off on a Friday night again. Before I start again, just to reintroduce myself, if you haven't heard my previous session, um, we are the 1994 investor. We have a blog that we share our financial knowledge with everyone and it's free for now. And um, some some uh, key key things about us, um, 80-20 rule, uh, everyone would know that there is this rule that says that every 20% of your effort is actually what gives the 80% of the result. And that is really what uh, made us start this blog. And that's what we want to achieve. And in this blog, we are, going, we are just sharing our knowledge and our interest in fundamental investing. Fundamental investing is really investing in businesses instead of uh, uh, doing technical trading. And in our blog, we are really making sense of all the financial jargon so that um, really retailers like uh, with less financial knowledge can understand what exactly is investing all about. So a brief description of our site. Um, we started in December last year. The main section of our site is really uh, we cover Malaysia stocks. We write up on their background, their financial analysis and really their valuation. We do quarterly financial updates of the companies that we cover. And we have a section on investing basics. Um, this one really to guide uh, newbies to start on fundamental investing. Over here, we really describe the, the steps from the really from the screening of companies to analysis of companies. We are still uh, really updating this this uh, this section. It, we are now on, on our fourth article there. And lastly, we have a portfolio update. It's really just to share us um, what, are, what are the kind of stocks we are holding in hand. And we do update every quarter. Uh, right now, we, we keep this privately to uh, very close followers. And that is really all about us. 
Uh, before we start, just again to repeat our principal investing, right? We do not do technical trading. So we look really at business fundamental, uh, whether the business is uh, fundamentally strong, whether there are growth prospects forward. We do not like uh, businesses in a sunset industry. And we, lastly, of course, we make sure what we buy is value. We do not uh, buy uh, uh, over, over, overvalued company. And long-term horizon is a, is, a, is a must thing because businesses don't change within a day or week. They, they take years to change. And this is really our investing principle. And whatever we, we, we are sharing today, we have to uh, keep in mind that these are what is uh, holding us back on all our judgment. For today's session, again, it's um, really the recovery team. We see that countries, even Malaysia, is stepping out from the COVID pandemic. Although cases are still high, right? We have to take care. But um, Prime Minister, again, and presidents across uh, countries have mentioned that we have to live together with this virus. If this stays here for the next two, two to five years, you cannot expect every lockdown every two months. So everything has to move. We have to forget the past and start living with this virus. And hence, um, recovery team is something, uh, something you can start looking at. And today we are going to share uh, how we define recovery play, right? And of course, what are the impacted industry and sectors? So this, this would be our target. And some of our picks within uh, two of the industries today we are going to share. So without further ado, let me start. So just a very brief description of recovery play. And this will guide us along this whole chapter. Um, recovery play is really looking at security or shares that has fallen in price, but is believed to have the ability to recover. So there is two parts in this sentence is a security that has fallen in price and they must have the ability to recover. So for this team, there is really just two things. You find what has what has fallen and you assess its ability to recover. It's not a broad-based um, play, but it's selective. So uh, an example is, say, in a consumer industry, you do not go broad-based just buying all stocks within the consumer sector. You have to be selective. Um, for many reasons, I will be walking through you at the next few slides. Right. So these are uh, our definition of recovery play. So if you look at um, these three things, the most the, the easy easy part is really identify what has fallen, right? You can just go to go to the the screener and, and find the, the the shares that have fallen uh, for the past 12 months by the highest percentage, and that you can easily find the first point. But the second point is the one that requires more due diligence more understanding of um, why did they fall and whether they can pick up, recover quickly or not. And uh, these are the three, for us, uh, uh, three things that we look at to assess the ability of a company or a business, whether they can recover. So starting from the left, um, the first question we always ask is whether the industry or the business fundamentals remain intact after the pandemic. So this is uh, the key thing we, we will always ask when investing is whether the business we understand two years ago, is it the same or is it better or is it worse off today? So a very good example is maybe um, I would say commercial offices. I do believe that demand for commercial office spaces uh, will squeeze after this. Um, big corporates have noticed that and realized that People can work from home equally efficient when they are at office. So that may be something uh, that have changed fundamentally. Even your business travel or your business accommodation, this would definitely be reduced because of uh, the, eff the efficiency of using Zoom meeting, right? It's always just a click away instead of you flying there two days. So that's the first first question we ask. Second question is how how much has this pandemic caused or impacted a company's financial position? 
So this would this would really give us a sense whether how long will this company recover. So if let's say the pandemic has caused a company to raise up uh, lots of debt just to stay surviving during the past 18 months, yeah, we really want to understand how much financial impact to their net profit. So increase in borrowings would normally directly give rise to higher finance costs. And so we, we just want to see how much does this eat up in their margin and how much can they how fast right can they pare down this debt and start moving as usual. So this is something we look for look for as well. Even uh good companies may be impacted quite badly in terms of financial position during such, such pandemic. And the third and last one, most important as well, is really how fast can they recover and what is the potential upside we have left, right? So even if they meet all three, but they do, have, they do not have any more potential upside, means it's not really a recovery play to us. Lah. Business may pick up, but share price has fully valued uh, all these things. So these are the three criteria we look for when we look for recovery play. So for the second agenda is really um, what are the industries that were impacted or sectors. So the first is uh, consumer products and retail related. This is uh, makes the most sense because we cannot go out doing shopping. We have uh, less spending power, right, for loss of income. And hence, these are the direct businesses that got impacted. Gaming, because they are non-essential, and so they, are, they were left, right, closed. Travel tourism, because of the lockdown restriction. REITs, REITs are really uh, more towards the commercial and the shopping. Um, industrial REITs did uh, fantastic quite for the past 18 months. And we have automotive. Uh, this was badly impacted during the early pandemic, but I think automotive, most of them went uh, built up recently because um, we know national car sales or even uh, Proton, Pradana are, are, are recording quite quite a strong growth right after the pandemic. And we have property development and construction. This is a sector that has been quite in a doldrum for, for many years, I would say. Um, if you look at property developer, they are selling at a price to book value of less than 0 0.5. Um, so it's really, again, we have to assess again whether um, are we expecting them to recover anytime soon? Because they have been really in the doldrum for many years and yeah, we are not sure whether this time is different. So today, we will touch on two, two of the sectors. First, we will be touching on consumer products and retail related. So again, um, this is really how we funnel our search or our stock pick ideas. As uh, I explained in the earlier section, so these are a few criteria we look for. We The first step, we identify businesses that were impacted. Then we, we go through the three stages of really filtering them. Business fundamentals, financial position, and what are the recovery and upside left. So we see some of the, the bigger brands I left it here. I leave it here to, to explain. So we have the breweries, we have the retail, Padini, Bonia, Parkson, we have the convenience store, my new 7-Eleven, and then we have some of the multi-level marketing, high O M way, and your electrical appliances and body shop. So if we go through the, I'm not really going to go through one by one, but just to show you, a quick filter up to these sectors and these companies. You see a business fundamentals. I will have removed Padini, uh, Parkson, maybe even Bonia, because uh, we know that after the pandemic, people are used to do online shopping. That's the first thing. All right. And even on e-commerce, you have much more selection, much more choices. And tr delivery time is now very, very fast. Right from chi from China, you can within a week you can receive your goods. So I think this really changed the fundamental of Padini and Parkson. It's no longer the the last the five years ago or ten years ago when uh, people just go to store to shop for Padini, right? 
Now, I, I think these, these things would change and margin would, would cut for them. And you see, if you move to financial position, I will remove my news and 7-Eleven. If you look at my news balance sheet, you will know that um, how much the pandemic has impacted them. Their cash has fallen to a record low. And I suspect or estimate that they will need to raise even a private placement or right issue um, in the near term to just sustain their fixed operating costs. And the same to 7-Eleven. Maybe 7-Eleven is not that bad, but uh, because of the impact to the financial position, for my news to repeat, it will take a longer time, a longer digestion period to really pare down its step and, and balance up the, or strengthen up its balance sheet. And if you see high O, Amway, Panasonic, even Body Shop, Body Shop is under in, in nature, but hard. These companies have really picked up back to the pre-COVID level. Uh, revenue profit is almost 80-90% there. I think share price is also back all the way up already. So the, the really two uh, remaining ones that we are going to really go much more in-depth today is um, our breweries, Carlsberg and Hennekin. Um, because they are so far the the worst impacted one because they are really total lockdown. <laughs> so they really shut their factory for the the first MCO was for seven weeks, and this second MCO, this second total lockdown is for eleven weeks. So they are the ones that remain cheap, right? But remain strong in everything. So let me go through Carlsberg and Hennekin. So why why I say that? The first thing is um it's a a product of inelastic demand. Uh, they the two brands monopolize the market. Uh, ninety five percent. The the five percent remaining is really for the the wine or liquor or or craft beers, right? Uh, favors. Um, they control the market in Malaysia. Demand is relatively in, inelastic. I will show you later at their financial position. Uh, financial performance. Uh, during the 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 downtime, they have a very strong balance sheet, right? They remain profitable and cash flow positive despite the lockdowns or closing of their factories. Um, I expect demand to pick up very strongly as indoor relaxation is allowed. And we, I'm going through the, the figures as well later just to show you a glimpse how fast their demand has picked up and the potential for a decent capital upside. Um, to show you again how much were they, were they worth before the pandemic and today, and attractive dividend yield of 4%. So any entrance at uh, today's price, two years down the road, you will get easily 4-5% uh, dividend as, as, they, as they increase their dividend payout back to their previous level. So just a glimpse, um, Carlsberg. So if you see, um, during the first MCO and in their second quarter 2020 results, their revenue dropped by half, okay? And profit dropped from 70 million to 10 million. But immediately after that, it bounced back close to 80%, 85% of uh, pre-COVID levels, making 400 over million, even 500 million uh, at the first quarter. Profit level almost back up all the way. In their first quarter 2021, they were making 70, 67 million. So that is really mm, 90% of pre COVID. But again, the latest quarter, we see that because of the total lockdown, uh, everything come back by half. So um, the total lockdown was the worst uh, to their impact because the first MCO was seven weeks and then now it's 11. So we see half of this impacted in the second quarter. Another half you will see get to be reflected in their third quarter. But from there onwards, I think the worst is really over for Carlsberg. Because um, if you follow up the trend uh, after the first MCO, so we can see, I think the fourth quarter, they were hitting, another, they were hit back up to the 500 million pro revenue level. And revenue, a profit really back up to 60, 70 million. So this is Carlsberg. So you can see impact-wise, 
really just that two quarters when lockdown is there, full lockdown. But we know that the fact government has say or even Prime Minister has said that lockdown is no longer uh, appropriate. Any states that move to second phase would not go reverse to first phase. And these are positive things that we view to our breweries in Malaysia. And we have Hennigan. You can see as well the first lockdown uh, hit them by 50% revenue. Then the following quarters that pick up same, 80-90%. And then uh, the latest quarter as well hit because of the total lockdown. So it's a very sim similar fashion to Carlsberg, right? And uh, just to understand, Carlsberg, in, Carlsberg Malaysia, listed in Malaysia, they sell in Malaysia, they export to Singapore, and they have an associate where they export to Sri Lanka. So it's really three countries. But Hennigan really sells just in Malaysia, okay? Just to give you a glimpse, uh, what are the products under Carlsberg? What are the products under Hennigan brand? So in Malaysia, right, Hennigan and Carlsberg, they have a similar revenue size, but Hennigan is slightly uh, larger in Malaysia in terms of market share because of, uh, yeah, because Carlsberg, part of uh, Carlsberg revenue is comprised from Singapore and Sri Lanka. So these are the brands that both companies hold. And so are there really the, the SWOT analysis of these two uh, businesses? Firstly, it's the, the strength is really, we see that rebound, it's really um, expected to be very soon as restaurants open up. They remain profitable despite pandemic. And I always love this point that their business model is superb, right? Why I say that? Is because they need require minimal capex and minimal R and D investments, and this is one of the best business you can have. Is because one recipe, you can use it for a hundred years, right? You do not you don't need to spend every year to really upgrade your your machine to be more efficient or to match up the techno technology changes, or you do not need to really research and do new new products. But one product you can sell for 100 years. And that's why you can see their, their cash flow from operations or free cash flow year on year is higher than their profit. Okay. And operating cash cycle, they have a very short, uh, for Carlsberg, it's even negative cash cycle. So they, they give uh, 60 days uh, credit terms, but they, their payable is 90 days, something like that. And Last point, they are all going big in premium. So what does this stand for? It's um, unlike the tobacco industry, margins are cutting down. They are, they are pushing out cheaper brands. But our breweries here are pushing out premium brands like Asahi, right? Your uh, your Hennigan would be your your stout or your all the craft beers. These are premium brands they are pushing with premium margin. So they are all moving up, moving up the the margin uh, in, in this sector. Weaknesses, uh, really worsening outbreak. Uh, maybe we see another variant that force uh, something un unavoidable that all of us don't want, uh, reimposing a strict lockdown again. Um, slower than expected recovery in on local tourism. We will see how long this, uh, this takes, but I understand that ministries are looking to open up borders and changes in consumer preference for healthier beverage, uh, something I think is unlikely, right? Increase excise duty for alcohol. This may happen, right? You see that recently they are, they are pushing up new bills to, to increase government revenue. But I understand that Malaysia has also one of the highest excise duty for alcohol. So this may, may be... Um, Impactful, maybe impactful. And last, of course, increasing raw material costs, barley, sugar, aluminium, logistic, and others. Uh, this is something obvious, and it's uh, mentioned by uh, Hennigan or Carlsberg headquarters in, in uh, Denmark. Um, but I think that if this happened, margin, it's inevitable, will be diluted. To the extent, we are not sure, but 
um, I would think if it's significant enough, the companies have the bargaining power to really increase the pricing. But this really depends if their competitors does so as well. So, uh, really wrong up for my for my pick within a consumer, the two breweries, right? I love their business model. Um, minimal capex, they can make good profit despite pandemic, generate positive cash flow, pay out 100% dividend. So at entry price today, 4 to 5% dividend yield and uh, capital upside, something I'll show you later at the chart. Um, second pick, I mean, our second view, gaming industry. And we know gaming industry, there's really just a few of the players. We have Magnum, Bridget Toto. Uh, these are the licensed operator. They have an oligo oligopoly market. License, so no one else can enter. Uh, financial position, similarly, they do not get impacted uh, so much. Inelastic demand, we'll show you how strong they have they sustained their business despite the, the lockdowns, right? And again, attractive dividend yield, we are expecting at least 5% to 7.5. So these are the figures you can see. At the first lockdown or first MCO, uh, revenue dropped by 90%, about there, yeah, 90%. Immediately after that, it picked up back 80, 90% of pre-COVID, similar to how breweries perform. And then again, the, the latest total lockdown brought it back to the 300 level, 300 million level. So it's around 50% of what they, they were doing previously. So again, um, Bridgeyan Toto uh, did fairly stronger than Magnum. I do not know much of the reason why, I mean, how do they uh, remain their dominance so strongly? First MCO again hit uh, back down by 70%, then it picked up very fast. By the second quarter, it was hitting 1.3B. It was back to the pre-COVID level, in, in fact. And then uh, they, they continue to run until recently. And um, a quick SWOT analysis on these two companies. Business revenue, we can see it recovered strongly. And we are good. We are, I'm sure they are going to repeat the same because uh, greed doesn't change. So <laughs> retailers are always greedy for right additional income. And a guaranteed profitable business so you really cannot see how they make loss, right? And attractive dividend you uh, six. Uh, this 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 gaming counters are not so capital upside, but you will expect a dividend you at a very quite handsome one. Looking at this low interest rate environment, some weaknesses. Um, something that is has been here for a long time, but it may have increased because of the pandemic and people shifting towards online gambling and your unlicensed operators. And lastly, again, something we think is unlikely, but just something to consider is shift in your consumer's appetite to shy away from gambling. So these are really the two gaming, within gaming that we like. And I'm sure everyone will ask Genting Malaysia, uh, what, what do we think about them? The If you look at their financials, you can see revenue has dropped half during the first MCO, and then it went all the way down to, I think they, today they are just performing 30-40% of their pre-COVID levels. And they have been making losses for all the quarters. They they remain to have a strong uh, cash power, or financial position, but um, it, it was impacted, definitely. So business now remains below the optimum. So it's around 30-40% pre-COVID uh, still loss making, right? The the reason why we shy away for now is because we have uncertainty on the policy for cross-border travels. So we know that they are in Pahang, but Pahang citizens or Pahang residents, I don't, don't think much will go to Genting. And most of them are, are really from KL, Slango. And so the uncertainty here, cross-border travel, is something we are holding back, as well as international tourism, something we, we do not expect to resume at least for the next six months. Even if so, 
right? The uh, it's really more for business travel, you would think. But for if you say for tourism, international tourism, we do not think that will happen anytime soon. And because of that reason, um it does not fit the, the last criteria where the speed of recovery is not as soon as we, we think. Uh. But definitely a counter to keep in mind. Mm, for this, for at the current moment, we would again prefer the the Magnum and Virgil Toto if you are looking for dividend yield, uh, attractive dividend yield at current price, it's an opportunity. So these are really the key takeaways. Um, again, not broad based, but be selective with your companies. Select businesses and industry with intact fund fundamentals. Uh, the, the pandemic sh should not change the, the business fundamental. Uh, those that remain who have strong financial position, right? You do not want their finance costs to eat up their margins moving forward. And again, they must have a, a I would say it's at least some expectation that their recovery will come back in in uh, six months or three, 12 months and some upside potential for you to, to gain. So before I go on to uh, our questions and answer session, just to show you the changes to the share prices. So you look at Carlsberg. You look at their one year chart or three years chart. Okay. So you see this, the crash happened here. Uh, before that, they, are, they were selling at the peak of 39 ringgit. Say that, that is really maybe too high. So we bring it out, say $30, 30 ringgit. Today they are selling about 22 ringgit. So if you you are 22 to 30, that gives you at least um how much is that? 30%. Yeah, about 30, 30, 40%, 30, 36%. So 36%, if you say within two years, it's quite a decent capital upside. 30% for two years, you, you're getting right 10, 15, 15% for two years. So this is Carlsberg. That's why we say there are capital upside there. Hennekin, let's have a look. Look, three years. So at that peak, there was also around 30, 31.7. Today they are around 20, 23. Yeah, so it's a very similar, similar uh, upside opportunity between Carlsberg and Hanukkah. Okay, if you look at Magnum or Black Toto, three years. Yep, so before the, the pandemic, they were around two, two fifty, two sixty. Today they are around two ringgit. So this one will also give you at least, I would say 20, 20 30 percent. Say you you give them some 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 way to run a runway or say one two years, even two years will give you thirty percent. It's really better than a, a lot of investment opportunity when something is so of so low risk. Yeah, we would say a low risk investment. And so with that, we can really move to questions answer. We can uh, see if you have any other other stocks that you think, right? Um, there are more opportunities. Back to you, Rui. All right. Uh, so thank you so much, Jin. So for those who have just joined us, a very good evening. And remember to like and share our video. And I hope you find Jean's presentation very insightful. Do give them a big love, you know, to show support. Now, um, do drop us your comments in the chat box and we'll try our best to answer any questions that you have relating to the topic. So in the meantime, I saw a few questions coming in. So there's a question from Mandy Lim. She's asking about Sedania. So Sedania, yeah. Sedania, okay, 
I'm really unfamiliar. Okay, let me okay. just have a look. Yeah, but, but in the meantime, I mean, how uh, they yeah. do, yeah, um, say because, financially. Mm-hmm. But let me just give a brief because um, I did mm-hmm. an interview with their group CEO, Mr. Daniel Rupert, recently to talk about the right. latest development, and mm-hmm. what they had they basically have five verticals, and they're very much uh, they used to be this airtime, you know, like a sharing company. But it has evolved into a technology company with five key businesses: the fintech, green tech, IoT, telco tech, and esports. So they have actually ventured into the health, um, health technology as well. They bought a fifty-one percent stake in Offspring Incorporated, Sandra Bahad. And just mm-hmm. last week, I think they signed a contract with Post Malaysia to provide green tech solutions to help Post Malaysia reduce energy consumption. But I think uh, for the financial, they are still loss making. I, but in the recent quarters, they have been making profits. So what do you think of the counter, Jin? Okay, I think I recall the session that I attended. Uh, right. The offspring temples, right? And uh, the e-sport gaming platform, right? Correct, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, this company is really at the start of a uh, I would say the the newest technology or the newest product. Uh, financially, if you see historically, cannot really see much because you see the last two quarters is really what the new investments contributed. So I'm really not sure of the new how much how much how strong are the new investments. But I heard that they are even um, they are looking to uh, uh, for the for the e-gaming e-gaming arm they are looking for really to spin it off one day but mm-hmm. yeah I, I really couldn't comment much on this never yeah. studied in depth <laughs> yeah they have quite a lot of businesses as well so but mostly all, right. all related to technology yeah mm. but yeah there are a lot of things going for them maybe we move on to the next question um is the ck the what do you think of Genting? i think you covered Genting earlier probably on a Broader base, do you have anything add to add on Gunting? Hmm. Yeah, I would remain uh to put put it aside for now. Um, but we would have, can definitely re- revisit when when there are much more certainty on on things, because we um even if you are talking about cross border travel, we see they are doing a the the trial with Langkawi, and I think we saw the news that okay there are five say five tourists that got uh, infected mm. by COVID. So yeah. we don't know how all these things will change cross-border travel. And at the day this doesn't start, Genting has really no, no upside for okay. you for recovery. Right? Okay. Mm. Right. So, yeah. okay, maybe we can look at <clears throat> a question from Mr. Isaac. How about the Naga National? Yeah. As people, businesses consume more electricity, so I guess that's also one of the biggest beneficiary, right? Yeah, this is a a, a definite lah because there are monopoly monopoly uh, for an, for every electricity they use. Um, but nothing much to to comment, right? Because but unless there's a potential hike in the tariff, so yeah. that also benefit them. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, so that would be a potential. It's not really for... uh, I would say a recovery play because they they mm. didn't really get hit much. Uh, I think as businesses um uh, were you know they they were not able to operate, so mm. I think a lot of their income were affected as well, right? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, so now everyone is like back to work and businesses are actually operating like normal already, more or less normal, only with uh, certain conditions. So it would actually um see more upside from the Naga National I guess. Yeah, it will go back to the previous level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, and then from Mr Lawrence C. How about your take on BAT? So another scene stock. Okay. Um a BAT I studied before before the pandemic, right? I didn't touch it uh, since and my take from my right uh i would say duty and analysis i would think if you compare the two biggest scene right the drinking and the smoking 
I would prefer the the breweries. The 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 main reason is really because if you look into BAT's past five recent years or three five years, they're always very concerned on the illegal cigarettes yeah. that is eating up their market share. Yeah. And government is really doing not much uh, on that. Yeah, and think, yeah. correct. And so for them to combat these cheaper lower prices cigarettes, right? They mm-hmm. are rolling out with cheaper uh, cheaper products yeah. that is squeezing up their margin. And it's not just because of your illegal cigarettes. You have your weight and your e cigar. And these things are really uh, taking up the, the market share. Even but they BAT, themselves. Yeah. The BAT has also come up with their e cigarette as well. So. Correct. They also came out, but I don't see, I mean, uh, among my friends, I, I don't see people going for their product. They, people oh. will, will go for other uh, other alternative. So mm-hmm. I see BAT moving down the trend. Even if they manage to grow their revenue, it's a very hard effort. It's a very yeah. tough fight doing a lot of sales promotion. But still, your margin getting lower because your product is always getting cheaper. So, in a in a medium to long term, right? I would definitely prefer our brewery guys. Ah, they are just looking to going going to premium products. But brewery also mm. affected by the illegal, you know, the imports. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. But um, yeah. So you see how if if the coffee shops in Malaysia that uh government imposed them with licenses on these things it may it may really bring down all these things but so far we do not see um the impact of this uh that to hit the breweries margin yet so we will reassess again but i i don't think drinks will get impacted like that la, so bad la. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay right um right, we have a question from chua yen um, probably your take on LB al- aluminium. Aluminium. LB okay, aluminium. aluminium, we know, is a commodity, and commodity yeah. ha- had made a very good run recently for for various reasons, right? Uh, yes. Moving housing sector in US, China, mm-hmm. uh, clamping down these uh, non eco eco productions. Mm-hmm. Then we have a this country called. G something for what G- the name Guinea yeah Guinea, Guinea yeah that yes. stop production of these things, and um as price goes up, right gross margin for al- uh, aluminium product productors manufacturers improve their fixed cost remain hence your net margin, uh, perform well. Um, the question is commodity stock cycle mm-hmm. whether you can sustain. If you talk about aluminium. I never thought of LB. Yeah. Um, the biggest name you would hear is Press Metal. Right. But I have noticed of one aluminium player called the PA Resources. Yeah. So they 90, 95% revenue to First Solar. They got a new mm-hmm. management in, I think, two years back. And they made a good run. In fact, their performance was also doing relatively well. Mm-hmm. So... Um, I quite like the aluminium product itself. I think construction or many materials are moving towards this light, uh, more uh, concrete or more solid aluminium. Um, But the comment on on the pricing, we we really need another session just to let you understand what drives or what factors are driving these these cyclical prices. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so and from Mr. Darren Chong, what do you think about plantation stocks? Plantation. <laughs> another <laughs> one another session for that. Yeah, yeah that, this is totally another session because yeah, there's a lot session. of understanding behind plantation, uh, yeah. supply and another... demand dynamics. And it's mm-hmm, really yeah. very much also influenced by countries setting up tariff, import-export tariff here and there. Mm, precisely, mm. yeah. Hmm. And then I think, I think you covered this PA, right? Um, yeah, I just mentioned yeah. the, another aluminium extruder. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, from Mr. C.K. Peter, which company do you prefer, Carlsberg? Hi, Peter, or I'm Carlsberg, Carlsberg fan. <laughs> I'm a Heineken fan, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you like? I guess, um, yeah, why? Okay, if I, fundamentally, yeah. okay, fundamentally, both are really similar. Net margin, they are making, um, before the pandemic, they, are, they were making 13% plus minus. I think recent quarters, they are making 10%. So they are really closing back up the gap. Um, market share, Henneken is slightly larger. I think maybe 55% than Carlsberg, the 40 over percent. A balance sheet wise, both are uh, net cash, but Henneken leverage more. Operating cycle wise, uh, Carlsberg they they have a negative operating cycle, so they are credit term they give to their coffee shop or their bars, they give them sixty days, but they got a payable of ninety days, inventory less than a month, so negative. Henneken they give their credit term longer, they give ninety days, so just that thirty days, so they, hence they they finance that with that. So but. All in all, really a similar similar business, similar profitability, balance sheet, even their products are or across board also good. Lah. So but if you ask me, I I I'm a head, uh, I prefer Carlsberg. I see Carlsberg. more upside at Carlsberg. Lah. Okay. Hmm. Not because you like the drink better. Drink I like stout though. Is that Hanukkah? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Alright, so from uh, Mr. Chu Yong, Carlsberg had a good run in the first half of 2019. That was, yeah, what was the catalyst? That was in 2019. Now I think before the, if you ask me before the pandemic, the catalyst for the breweries counter were always, always at the end of the year. It's always Chinese New Year. Mm. That's when their price yeah. will go up. And the second thing is because of their, their strategy. Or going into premium products, so uh, investors are all expecting their them to get better margin margin, and that was really the catalyst before the pandemic. But now we are talking a different catalyst, uh, a catalyst of recovery. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Since we're on the topic of um, worry, uh, brewers, right? So mm. I noticed that Heineken saw impressive sales growth. You know, this is off a low base. And they have gained market share too. And this was um, amid operations being suspended since June 1st due to the pandemic measures. But the second quarter 2021 sales grew by 38% year on year mm. off a low uh, base in the previous year. Right. So I was just wondering, um, and also they have this premium beer, premium wheat beer, <clears throat> the elder vice. So mm. these factors combined, they have they are more resilient. Um, you know they have they appear to have uh, upper hand re- relative to Carlsberg. So do you think that Heineken will continue to register such impressive growth, and will its premium beer continue to be the customer's preference over Carlsberg's? My personal opinion, they will they will do fairly the same, um, because Carlsberg. As well, they have their own premium beer section. I think Carlsberg, their premium beer, they are those are the brands like your Cronenberg, Asahi, Summersby, and Henneken. They have their own as well. So I think they will, um, they are in the same direction, right? And mm-hmm. I think growth wise, both would do similar for the next few years, which is around ten percent top line. Yeah, okay. that's my expectation of them, lah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. So there's not much uh difference between the two. Yeah, I think both would, would do the run quite closely, lah. Okay, mm. I think you're talking about the um margins as well. So Heineken's mm. margins actually improved significantly on the back of higher sales and the OPEX discipline. Um, is second quarter twenty twenty one EBIT margin improved to. 9.6% on the back of higher revenue. <clears throat> mm. But then given the in, you know, but yeah, given the increasing raw material costs, you think this will erode its margins significantly. So I think this applies to Carlsberg as well. Correct, correct. 
Um, this is this was something um sound sounded, and it was really uh, uh, informed to the analysts in the in from the headquarters of uh, Henneken or Kalsberg. They they mentioned that it's inevitable that raw material mm-hmm. price has increased. And in fact, many other players were impacted. Your the likes of your Dutch lady, your Nestle, uh, in uh, overseas, your I think even Pepsi, Pepsi informed this uh, same message, mm-hmm. and many of them say that they will need to pass down the cost because the increase in commodities is I think easily more than fifty percent. Uh. So oh, that's huge. correct, correct. So I think it will hit their margin in the near term until they they decide to um, pass on the cost. But before they pass on the cost, they would have to wait. Lah, see Kalsbo and they can pass first, right? Yeah. <laughs> then they will follow yeah. suit. And they can't really pass on so much because like, uh, for instance, like annually, right? Heineken raises its ASP, the average selling prices, by a low single digit only. So, but then analysts think that this would be sufficient to elevate alleviate any concerns over the significant pressure on margins. So I guess if if fifty percent increase in raw material, that'd be quite significant. Yeah, yeah. So I think the next maybe the next two quarters is something we have to look for, look after. We have to really analyze their gross margins. Yeah. Yeah, but I so think, far uh, it's, mm, I don't think the management indicate uh like how severe okay. is the impact yet? Yeah, but based on some of the reports that I read, you know, the management has actually um, mentioned that they are contemplating a balance between absorbing the cost through the mm. streamlining of its operations and passing the cost to its consumers. So it's a mix of both. And mm. any pass-through cost should be manageable. You know, that's what the analyst thinks. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but we will see how lah, because yeah. you know, commodities price can just keep going up and they have no choice to do it. Correct, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so maybe I'll take a question from Mr. Hans. So can you comment on Susol and Denko? Okay, I'm not familiar with Susol. <laughs> and Denko, right? Okay. Denko, I hear them, but I don't call. Yeah, they have uh, recently acquired few businesses and hence you see increase in revenue and profit. But mm-hmm. um, I would, I mean, I would shy away from companies that do too many acquisitions in a short period of time. Ah, okay. Yeah, some okay. Con- I, I, I have concerns on, yeah, not, not too diligent. Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, okay. not, not too sure on so. so. Sorry about that. Just, okay, yeah. Right, moving on <clears throat> to the next question from Mr. Darren Chong. He said that will the current China Evergrande group issue affect Malaysia stock market? Mm, if you say fundamentally, I don't think there would be any impact. Uh, I don't think any of our bank has exposure to them, first. Mm-hmm. Okay. Secondly, even if they purchase Malaysia assets, and they want to liquidate or sell off and redeem cash, um, I don't think that will impact us in the in the overall stock market. Lah. But maybe sentiment-wise, yeah, always Malaysia is just a small guy, right? So you always follow the big boys. When they fall... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll fall follow, harder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Sentiment, lah, but Darren, yeah. fundamentally, I don't think they are... Um, Really, any change? Okay, great. And then, um, so, then what is your take on Encom? And Encom, I heard their briefing before, but I, I cannot remember much. I remember they have two, right? One Encom logistic, one doing the fertilizer, and something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have um, various businesses, but yeah, not too familiar but, about the yeah fundamentals and all. Cannot comment on this as well. Sorry, okay. What about how about um Jax? Jax? Uh, I never studied before, but mm-hmm. uh I did a very brief duty last time and I decided not to touch the company. Even oh. uh Kun Yu Yin. 
it was a big uh-huh. investor last time. Yes. Even uh-huh. he himself is getting out of checks. He says that the management okay. he cannot get a board seat and the management wasn't transparent in this and that. So these uh-huh. are the s- signs that yeah, I'm just not going to t- look into these counters lah. Mm, okay. From a yeah, from a fundamental point of view. But that's based on Mr. Kun Yuin's blog. Yeah, right? and the and you look at the company management, they are in, in fact not, not so transparent in many things. Mm, okay. Such as yeah, their disclosure. They they have been mm-hmm. investing in their their power plant or something in Cambodia. But progress has been oh. slow no updates and many issues that arise. Mm, okay. Mm. Okay, let's do it. All right, from <clears throat> Mr. Lawrence C, any comment on DKSH? Because recently the price has spiked and the last two quarter profit increase with recent appointment for vaccine distribution. Yeah, so DKSH is a very quite a huge distributor for many brands consumer mm-hmm. brands and mm-hmm. recently run up also because of the vaccine agreement um but i do not know what what does that uh is it an mou or is it a they are they are the sole distributor for that vaccine yeah because without that knowledge i cannot really comment because sometimes <laughs> your price move mm-hmm. based on rumors right yeah. Hmm. Yeah, to look at um yeah the agreement the MOU yeah, yeah, in I, detail. Yes, I prefer more concrete to really to make sure lah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Right, moving on to the next question from Mr. Eric. Ben, can you comment on CCK and the increase in chicken price recently? Oh <laughs> I didn't know chicken <laughs> price increase, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you don't eat chicken, huh? okay. But I don't buy that normally. You don't buy, okay. <laughs> right. CCK. Sorry, Eric. I cannot answer you as well. Okay. I didn't right. ever studied, studied before. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So from Mr. CK, Peter, what do you think of SAM Engineering? Planes are starting to fly. Okay. Okay, Peter. Um, If you visit my, my site, I, I did cover them, I think... I think last year or early this year, when they were selling at seven, seven, eight bucks, they are in fact a very good company. They have a one of the most advanced technology in terms of your your um, I would say your electronic or your plain machine a uh, plain parts um precision manufacturing, but because of the plain um, all locking down. Their biggest customers like Boeing, Airbus, and all just stop orders, and hence they were loss making for a few quarters at the airplane segment. And Sam has actually transformed it a little, where you see their semiconductor equipment segment has been increasing up to seventy percent of their revenue already. So, uh, yes, planes are start flying back. Mm, but I think their aeroplane segment is still there. It's still down there. Uh, it's, it's not turning profitable anytime soon yet. The price has indeed moved up back to 14 plus. Uh, they are not too expensive. Because if you compare to your other precision players, uh, like uh, UWC, like your Kobe, your, your PE is around 50 times. But Sam is, I think... 30 or 30 plus I think now so if you look at equipment side play of things they are still cheap lah, but there are there are a few things that you have to take note um, SAM margin is not as well I think their net margin 15% plus minus but UWC makes 30 and SAM is very cornered stock they are 70% owned by the Singapore parent co yeah. so yeah even if you it, it may move up and down very quickly because of that low low spread lah. Mm. Something to take note. Okay. But fundamentally, yes, like it's a it's a very well managed and good company. Mm. Okay. 
Mm. Okay. Right, from Mr. Peter Tio, how about KGB and DNO? Very mm. active. The hot, yeah, yes, the hot, hot stocks, stocks because yes. of uh, riding on the semiconductor team. Mm -hmm. Kellington do the high, ultra high priority industrial manufacturing of the pipe, the whole system. I think they recently secured contracts. Singapore right. and quite quite huge contracts as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. They know does your LED design manufacturing for many of the big uh auto vehicles in the world. I think Mercedes, Tesla, Benz all under them. Uh the only question is really their valuation, right? Fundamentally we know they are they have a good prospect, strong balance sheet, and a strong profitable business that generates actual cash flow. Um, valuation wise, something to to be I, I would be wary of. I would think twice, yeah, before entering at at today's today's pricing mm. What do you think, Doreen? The is their price? Yeah, probably a bit. Giving you more outside? Any more outside? Um, it's very hard to say. I guess you're looking at the growth because semicon uh, business mm. is very much a growth story where people believe in in you know in the future. So mm. I guess even though you look at high valuations, but people are still mm. willing to put their investments into these stocks, especially if mm. you're looking at good and strong fundamentals. I think yep. something that you can consider. Mm. Yeah. So I think P. You look at the price earnings growth mm. ratio. I think if DNO can can increase thirty percent, their PE say some today I think sixty and more. Um, two times PEG, I would say is a high side mm. I would prefer taking the risk at Alibaba. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, yeah. All right. My take, my take. Yeah. Okay. Right, so okay, this um comment from Mr. Lawrence C. You recommended Nova, so probably you want to find out more about this counter. Well, thanks, thanks, Lawrence, for following me. Yeah, your follower. <laughs> okay. Yeah, not bad. Okay, so Nova, <laughs> they 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 have uh, their own brand. They do health supplements, uh, beauty products, and they are going into. Your your beauty products they are going to that segment. They do their own manufacturing. They do their own brand, and they distribute via online and then pharmacies lah. Um, they do profitability very good. Gross margin seventy plus percent, close to eighty. Mm. Net margin thirty thirty over percent. So these are the business I like, right? Strong margin that they can sustain long term. Because it's their own brand, they do their own manufacturing. They do their own research. Um, growth wise, year on year, they are doing close to ten percent, very organically. Financial position is a net cash. Uh, valuation today, I think around seventeen times. So it's, I would say, all in all, it's a fully, I mean, fairly valued company, right? If but if you are looking for a I mean, value investors like us, we try to try to buy in when it's cheaper, lah. So seventeen times is something you can sit on, lah. That gives you two percent dividend, because until you have a strong catalyst, say they are entering to a new geographical market, or they have a new product that really hit the shelf and just got running very strongly, those catalysts may um push up our expectation on the PE multiple. But at current, with uh, their, I would say, BAU style, organic growth, I would say 17 is quite fairly valued. Lah. But fundamentally, they are very strong. Very strong company, strong strong product. Even the pandemic, they, they, they continue, continue to record growth, in fact. Yeah, that's all, Lawrence. But um, who are the peers that you compare Nova with? When you look look at valuations, right? I mean, whether they're cheap or yeah. whether they're. Mm. This one I compare them to your high O, your MB, your uh, YSP that do 
Oh, this supplement is distribution, yeah. This okay. they are yeah. Yeah. high O and B. They are also selling 18, 18 times like that, something like that. Okay, but um, high O ML uh, <clears throat> and B, they are more MLM kind of business, right? Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm. but they pay more decent dividend lah. Over mm -hmm. there, they pay four percent and above. Uh, for high O. Oh. Yeah, I think both high O and base around there. Okay. Mm. All right. So, Mr. Hans, he said he asked you which sector do you think is worth to put more emphasis on. If you, if it's on the recovery, uh, I think every sector. I mean that few six sectors, you have opportunity there. Hence, it's really not to be broad-based but selective. Yeah. And if you, if you say consumer, it's as what I recommended. I would say Carlsberg or Heineken. I prefer Carlsberg, as I said. Mm. And then gaming, if you are more towards the dividend play, not so uh, not so risk-taking, then you can go for the NFO. So every sector, you will have opportunities. Uh. Next next few sessions, I can even share other, other sectors. And you can see... If you are being selective, if there are always this kind of decent opportunities, I would say something that gives you a year more than your ten percent, close to fifteen percent, something decent really. Yeah. Yeah, I guess if I may add, like for the NFO segment, right? The so Giant Sports Auto and Magnum, they're actually trading at attractive valuations of about eleven to twelve times the forward twenty twenty two PE. So this is the below the sector's three year mean of about fourteen to fifteen times. So such valuations are you know very appealing for a sector which is very asset light, and you know it it does out most of the domestic cash flows as dividends. So yeah, this is actually a good opportunity. Hmm. Yeah. So if you if you follow me closely, my I mean our principle is always. First is not to make loss, right? Or you minimize your loss. So these are the counters that really have a very I was to us it's really a very low downside. Right? The mm. worst that can happen is really another COVID lockdown or the uh, excise duty increase. But these are very low risk factors. But the upside there there is a much more to it lah for us. Yeah. Right, because mm. now the uh, dividend yield, I think it's only about what four percent or so. Mm. Right, but I think moving yeah. forward, like uh, analysts are expecting um, NFO segment to be more appealing for their resilient prospective yield of more than seven percent in FY twenty twenty two. So, and then also that there's a potential granting of replacement draw days by the government. So, the more draws they have, <clears throat> the more revenue they can bring in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think seven percent uh, dividend is not, not, not too high. It's uh, mm -hmm. something that you can expect. So if you look at Bajaj Total's past dividend payout compared to the, compared to the current price, if you bought it today, and you wait for two years, and that is really what you can expect: seven percent dividend yield. Yeah, mm. even for Magnum, also right. Yes, correct, correct, mm -hmm. correct. But the okay. horizon is something two years you have to wait. Uh. <laughs> two years passes very fast. Yeah. <laughs> very fast for it. <laughs> okay, so what's uh, from Inche Pisani? What's your take of on um, MGRC? Sorry, Inche Pisani. <laughs> mm -hmm. I tried, tried understanding MGRC, but too technical for me to understand the biotechnology, ah, yes. bio, biology bio. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, too. I just don't understand. Okay. Hence, I yeah, I don't invest or I don't don't plan to. Okay. Right. So from Mr. Lawrence again. So my news has got a franchise of CU Korean Convenience Store, and the plan mm. to open about five hundred outlets within the next three to five years. Will this be a catalyst for them? And with the recovery, they should be doing better, right? Okay. For my news, um. On their statement to open 500 stores within the next five years, I think a little bit bullish. Maybe that was something they said earlier. But mm. if you look at their latest balance sheet, you will notice their how much have their have the impact 
cost them because they they do they they rent or they lease these outlets, and when pandemic hits, their fixed costs remain, but their everything come down. Their revenues slides, their margin follow suit because they even started their own bakery production, and because they could not couldn't reach your economic skill, margin hit. So this pandemic really caused the the balance sheet to to be quite bad. And I I think they would need to raise uh, capital or bot or debt funding to in the next next two quarters to just sustain. So if you say for expansion wise, I don't know how they are raising that that fund. Hence, uh, I don't think although business may pick up, right? But for them to pay down their debts and really strengthen their balance sheet. It's another long, long effort, lah, to me. Hmm. Okay, but I think um to to have the presence, they need to really expand, so that you know they they have um they will be growing the franchise, right? I think there's mm. probably um agreement that they have to reach certain stores within a certain mm. period of time. Yep. 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 So maybe maybe mm, the Korean will will invest or pump in capital. Okay, but that we we are not too sure yet. Yeah, but looking at the last quarter, yeah, I decided to stay away lah. From my news. Mm, okay. Yes. All right. Okay, maybe um <clears throat> from Mister Chu Yang, can you comment on revenue at this current valuation? Okay, Chu Yang, I also covered revenue uh, in my in my site, and I think in my last coverage. And my last understanding was their valuation was four, four, fifty times and above. And I mean, in all, what I remember is revenue is a good company, good management, good prospect. They are in a in a really a sunrise industry. But valuation wise, I think it's P E G ah, price earnings growth ah, I think two times and above. So I'm not the Not that risk taker, lah. <laughs> so not not my appetite at this at this valuation, I would say. But okay. it, fundamentally, it's really good. If you if you are bought early, you can just hold and hold for the next few years, ah. Hmm. Okay. Mm. Right from Unche Isani. So I think this your one of your favorite stock, uh, MI Tech. So it's starting yeah. to go up upwards. So is that and in at this anticipation of good upcoming quarter results. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, you so covered that in the previous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but share price, you know, lah, uh, move, <laughs> move every day, every mm. week. Something go up, something go down. Yeah, correct. Uh, if you just think about the fundamental, I would think next few quarters will be good for them as well. I mean, they have been seeing the same thing in the quarter report that they are very optimistic. They are seeing stronger demand. Their expansion into China, Korea, Taiwan has completed. Now it's a religious, religious to start, start up the engine and doing the marketing to, to bring in the sales. So I think it's a. I think they they have a good prospect for a quite a long, long run. But we will see how how the the management really turns turn his words ah uh, into action. Yeah. I guess if um, you want to find out more about MI Tech, can watch our previous um, session with Jin where he elaborated yeah. more on MI Tech innovation. Yeah, that yeah. was on the semicon industry, right? Hmm. Yes. Okay. So, I guess um this is our last question for the night. So thank you so much uh for staying for, with us for more than an hour and do check out Jin's blog. He has a very good write up on um his top. Picks like on the 1994 investor dot com. Do follow him on Facebook and Instagram. And if you have missed the earlier part of the show, and you want to look at some of the points that um, was highlighted by Jin, do watch the recording, which will be uploaded on our Facebook page and website sifu dot my later. And do remember to like, share, and comment our video. Yeah, um, Jin, you have anything else to add? Um, maybe just um for the. Listeners or followers, just post up more comments or 
what are what are the topics you would like to hear yeah. or you would like us to deep dive into any specific companies in the next session feel free to comment or yeah. we'll try to yeah give yeah. you a good one yeah so you can start putting in your comment which um, stock or industry that you want Jin to cover next friday we'd be more than happy to put this sticking cap and give you very good analysis on this Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Izani. Yeah, thank you. So, if there's nothing else, I will see you next week and have a great weekend ahead. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you. Thank you, Jane.